Ferrers and their legacy live on in our imaginations. But behind the popular image, there's a new story to tell. One of the most celebrated eras of human achievement was a world built on animals. The Egyptians really, I think, could be viewed upon as a nation of animal lovers. It was a love that went far beyond merely keeping pets. They thought animals could be used to channel the powers of the gods for good and evil. You take an animal that is potentially very dangerous and you use its power to protect you. Feared and revered. You might think that animals never had it so good. But it's such high status come at too high a price. It's time to take a look at ancient Egypt again through the eyes of the sacred animals of the pharaohs. This is the story of a mission to dig deep. Two hundred meters below the blistering desert, the race is on to reveal a new side of the ancient Egyptians. These passages were built 3,000 years ago as underground stores for mummies. With thousands of tons of sand above, there's a sense that the tunnels could collapse at any minute, but they press on. For them, it's worth the risk. Professor Joris Peters from the University of Munich has a rare skill. He's a paleozoologist, working to find evidence of how the ancient Egyptians treated animals. And that's the reason why we have to travel to Egypt and try to find more bones, more material, especially, if possible, complete individuals. And this is a major task. At Tuna El Gabel, 300 kilometers from Cairo, Joris will join a front line in research into what is meant to be a sacred animal. The hope is that the unusually well-preserved remains at this site could change the way we think about Egyptian beliefs. In these deep underground chambers lie the remains of four million mummies. Animal mummies. In recent years, a number of parent mummy factories have been opened and stories have spewed out of Egypt of terrible animal abuse and mass killing. But can new evidence shed light on the mindset of these people? Were the pharaohs really cruel when they used animals in worship? Just as claustrophobia begins to set in, a fantastic find. the jawbone of a young monkey. Piecing together the story of this little primate might help Yoris to understand what was really going on back then. As Egyptologist Kasia Sherpakovska knows. It was a very complex relationship between people and animals and their role in religion, and that's why it seems complicated to us today. Yoris's approach is to find evidence of how certain sacred animals lived and died. In ancient Egypt, uh, people have produced a lot of depictions of animals on the walls of the tombs. And what we see actually is that these animals are all healthy and it's a huge variety of species. It is of interest to know whether these animals are really healthy and that's the reason why we try to look at animal remains from archaeological sites. And I'm particularly interested in uh, baboons and sacred ibises. It is of interest to know whether these animals were kept and bred at these places and whether they were really healthy. But to do that will involve waking the dead. The 5,000-year-old Joseph Pyramid, oldest of all, and countless other temples sparked an interest in unraveling the secrets of the sacred animals of ancient Egypt. Sculptures, paintings and texts, richly inspired by nature, captured the world's imagination. Some animals represented a living connection to the gods. Others were even allowed to make the final judgments on a human soul at the gateway to the afterlife. 
Animals influenced a rich array of gods, controlling life and death. Horus, the falcon god of the sun. Apis, the bull with the power of the creator. Anubis, the jackal-headed god from the underworld. And the sacred scarab beetle linked to the sun god, Ra. The list goes on. At the University of Wales, Kasha believes that many answers to why animals were sacred don't rest with the gods or the pharaohs. What I'm interested in is finding out what the common people, people like you and I, what they did, how they prayed, who they prayed to when they were scared, what did they do to protect themselves. If we can understand what people were scared of, maybe we will understand the role of sacred animals. For Dr. Aidan Dodson from the Bristol University in the UK, looking at major gods like Thoth can help. Thoth was the clever god. He was the scribe of the gods. He was regarded as having invented writing, for example. And he had two sacred animals. One was the ibis, probably because the ibis looks clever. It's sort of, you know, that, with its long beak, it gives an idea of perhaps a scholarly kind of individual. The other um, aspect of him was the baboon, almost a complete opposite. It's very much a, a different kind of behaving animal. Baboons, one of the things they do in the morning is they get very excited when the sun rises and almost act as the herald of the rising sun. So Thoth is an interesting um, god in having two d distinct um, sacred animals. Can understanding the role of the gods like Thoth help explain the primate bones found in Tuna el Gabal? If animals like the baboon and ibis were so revered, how could they have been killed in their millions? Have we misread the signs? Or did being a sacred animal mean paying the ultimate price? Were the ancient Egyptians nature worshippers or animal killers? As archaeologists dig to unlock the secrets of the ancients, they reveal a very different picture of Egypt. Just by looking at hieroglyphs, it's clear that the ancient Egyptians brought animals to the heart of their religion and day-to-day -day life. But unravelling why they did this is another matter. Piece by piece, a body of evidence is emerging from the dust and it's turning up a few surprises. This was once the realm of giants. 7,000 years ago, these lands were very different. Reverse massive climate change, and you're back in a landscape not unlike the plains of East Africa today, with the life-giving Nile at its heart. Animals and people flourished, but the Egyptians did something unique for a mighty civilization. They set out to live in harmony with nature. This was part of their world. This was a part of their day-to-day -day life. And they integrated this and brought it into their religion, so they worked with it, not excluding it, not making it outside of their life. Their life, the religion, the animals, the people were all part of a whole. They must have had a big reason to try and maintain a balance with the natural world. Nothing is bigger than creation itself. And according to Egyptian beliefs, animals reigned from the very dawn of time. To them, the world began when a sacred cow, Emet Waret, rose from the waters of creation. She gave birth to the sun. And where she rested her feet on the water's surface, earth was formed. It's not surprising that domestic animals found their way into myth and religion. They were a source of food, companionship, and labor. But for some reason, certain creatures were singled out for special treatment. Upper-class animals. 
This colossal 70-ton tomb in Memphis is proof that certain animals were given incredible positions of power. As extravagant as the sarcophagus of any king, this was the final resting place of a bull, attributed to Apis. Apis was the god of virility, with a cult-like following. A single animal was chosen from bulls across the land as his representative. It's important to recognize that the Egyptians, contrary to one's popular belief, didn't believe that all representatives of a specific species were divine. So that it was quite true that you had a bull sitting in a temple, but the bull just over there was not a god. He was simply a potential dinner. Only one bull at a time could be crowned the Apis bull. It lived a pampered life in the temple and upon death was mourned by the nation, but not until after an unusual ceremony. The king may have eaten the bull when it died, therefore to take on to his own person some of the divine power. And given this was probably a 20-odd-year-old bull, you can imagine that the meat was perhaps not of its tenderest, so I suspect the king might have viewed having to eat this thing as a religious trial. Particularly as the earliest one we have an example of for this, the contemporary king had extremely bad teeth, including major abscesses. So trying to, trying to munch his way through um, some rather aged beef must have been a, a truly um, divine experience. It seems that in religion, the Egyptians chose influences from what they saw around them. During pharaonic times, human settlers flocked to the rich floodplain of the Nile. Wild animals also loomed large in the ancient Egyptian mindset. Living close enough to enjoy the river's wealth meant having some pretty lethal neighbors. Nile crocodiles no doubt killed people. But how did the Egyptians rationalize such a dangerous animal that was beyond their control? At the American University in Cairo, Dr. Salima Ikram has a compelling theory. They believed to some extent that certain animals were representative of certain gods. So a crocodile would be representative for the god Sobek. And the Egyptians believed that the spirit of the god would enter into one particular crocodile. They would pray to it, they would care for it, and it would be a god. By channeling the terrifying killing power of crocodiles into the god Sobek, the people perhaps convinced themselves that they could convert their fear to something more useful. No expense was spared when it came to worshipping their crocodile god. When it died, they would bury that god after mummifying it in a very elaborate way, the same way that you would do for kings or indeed any other divinity. The crocodile's body was dried and embalmed with salts before being carefully wrapped and decorated. But why take dangerous animals with you into the afterlife? An interesting point about Sobek and other gods who were represented by dangerous animals is that there was two sides to them. And through the cult, it was hoped that the god would tame, if you like, the dangerous side, but also channel the power inherent in that dangerous side towards good, towards the king and towards the good of Egypt. And the crocodile isn't the only potential man-killer that these ancient religious cults set out to tame in their unique way. Its heavyweight opponent, the colossal hippopotamus, also had something the pharaohs wanted. Despite its bulk, an unprotected hippo calf is at the crocodile's mercy. But as social herding animals, the calf's mother is never far away. She will stop at nothing to protect her calf, and two tons of hippo is a force to be reckoned with, even for a crocodile. Despite the danger, this devotion was something the Egyptians couldn't help but admire. 
hippos are the most dangerous animal in Egypt even today. And so the concept is you take an animal that is potentially very dangerous and you use its power to protect you rather than harm you. The hippo is also uh, a feminine goddess when she is protective um, as well. And in part, again, it might be because hippos have such a big belly and that emulates the big belly of a pregnant woman. So visually, it brings to mind uh, a pregnant woman. Luckily for female hippos, death and mummification wasn't part of the ritual. People found other means of harnessing the animal characteristic they wanted so badly for themselves. We find spells that are written that refer to praying to Taweret, the hippo deity, in order to help pregnant women, especially go through childbirth and have a safe childbirth. That was a very, very vulnerable time for Egyptians, was the first five years of their life, and there was a high infant mortality rate. In ancient Egypt, the average lifespan for a person was only 30 years. So the supreme mothering skills of the female hippo made her a heroine. Ahead of their time in many ways, these people saw the interconnectivity of life. This beautifully observed lapis lazuli hippo is complete with a symbiotic bird. But you couldn't always rely on the gods to protect you. Sakhmet was a lioness, um, and she was very much the violent side of felines. Um, according to one myth, she tried to destroy mankind on one occasion and was only prevented from doing so by dyeing some beer red, which she then drank, thinking it was blood, got drunk, and by the time she'd sobered up, she'd sort of forgotten about her desire to kill the whole of humanity. It therefore meant, though, that her, her, her festivals tend to be rather drunken affairs, where red beer was drunk um, and you got drunk in honour of the goddess. Despite Sakhmet's debauched reputation, lions too were among the sacred remains. Lionesses in particular were singled out. People often say Sakhmet is a lion god. And I was correct and I go, no, specifically it's a lioness. Because if you know anything about animals, and the Egyptians certainly did, they were keen observers of nature, um, you know that it's the lioness in the pride who does most of the work and not the lion who usually sits back and enjoys the fruits of the labor of the female. And the Egyptians noticed that, and so that deity is always feminine. This aggression and skill in the hunt became the traits associated with a powerful goddess, Sakhmet. And it wasn't just her physical prowess that they respected. In times of need and desperation, the Egyptians would turn to her for help. We have a number of different statues that were erected to the goddess Sakhmet. Um, and we think in those instances that perhaps indicates that there was a lot of disease. One theory has been that there was a large um, amount of disease at that time. And so the pharaoh had a number of these statues, literally hundreds of the goddess erected to try and protect his people. Life was short, merely a waiting room for the afterlife. But just how far were they prepared to go in their quest for eternal happiness? At key dig sites, two characters are emerging. The two sacred animals belonging to the god Thoth. Could they hold the key to unlocking the question of whether the ancient Egyptians were cruel or kind to animals in their drive to please the gods? The sacred ibis and its long curved bill, used for probing prey in the mud, has become a familiar symbol in Egyptian art. One trait that singled out this creature is its ability to eat snakes, greatly feared by the people. Snakes, too, were considered godly, and for the ibis to eat them meant it had to be linked to a deity of the highest order. Thoth's other sacred animal, the baboon, was a species destined for extinction in Egypt. But still, it left its mark. As the civilization advanced, times changed. The sacred ibis lost its home when wetlands were drained for farming. The baboon 
seemed to greet the sun god Ra as they warmed up after a cold night, faced an uncertain future for very different reasons. Ra was all-powerful, the god of gods. But because people thought baboons were close to Ra, they used these creatures as oracles to predict the future. So far, sacred animals have been attributed to good luck, health and prosperity. But just as the Egyptian world was divided, so too were their beliefs. Although southern Egypt, bathed by the Nile, was lush, just kilometers from the river, the desert ruled. Egyptian society was one of order and control. They may have considered themselves at one with nature, but they hated chaos. And the constantly shifting sands that swamped their buildings and temples became attributed to a dark god of the underworld, Set. Set, although he was a murderer, and there's no, it's, it's unequivocal. He also, however, was a perfect respectable god as well as a patron god of southern Egypt, but also of the desert as well. And I think that desert, the, the dry, dangerous heat of the desert, ties in with his murderous role, his bad side. Set murdered his brother, Osiris, one of the best-loved gods of all. Any animal able to survive in the realm of Set was considered frightening and unnatural. The spitting cobra was one of the most feared of all desert animals. Its striking shape common in art and religion. The cobra was believed to have great godly power. Snakes, again, are, are particularly important to animal in Egypt because of their very strange nature. They move strangely, they shed their skin and are reborn. Uh, they have this incredible power, again, to, to spit their poison, to harm you. They were used by the pharaohs, who often wear one on their forehead. But a regular person like you or I could also take advantage of that fiery, uh, spitting power of the cobra by making a little figurine made out of clay. And so it's likely that these little figurines could be used in spells. Most of these spells are to keep away demons of the dark, nightmares, for example. And the idea being that you would place them in each corner of the room and therefore prevent all these entities con from coming in and assaulting you when you're vulnerable um, and asleep. There was a lot of fear in the desert. Death was all around. Jackals, believed to be grave robbers, were associated with dead bodies and became synonymous with the god in charge of mummification, Anubis. Anubis was the chief embalmer. He was a pickler in chief, if you like. But he was also a guard dog. He's shown protecting the burial grounds. Anubis brings the dead person, having been through various ordeals and so on, into the judgment hall, where his heart is placed on a pair of scales. In the other is the feather of truth, and the idea is that the two, the two pans should weigh the same, because the heart is the seat of intelligence and memory. So if, you, if you're pure, you haven't done anything wrong, the two should be together, and you can pass through to the next world. But there were a few things you could do to help your soul on its journey after death. The Book of the Dead gives things to say that the deceased would need to know in order to get successfully into the afterlife. Who was guarding certain gates to get in, knowing their names, their attributes. It also included a list of what are called the very famous 42 negative confessions, listing 42 things that you didn't do. Although many of them have to do with things like not stealing any cattle from the temple, there are also some such as I didn't make anybody cry, um, which is one of my favorites. Otherwise, there was a goddess called Amit, whose name means the devourer. And she was made up of three parts of the most scary animals in Egypt. She had the um, rear end of a hippo, the four parts and four legs of a uh, lion, and the head of a crocodile. And if your heart didn't weigh out, she would be there to snatch it up and eat it. In a sense, it was not people but animals that controlled the most important aspects of life. All dog-like animals, not just jackals, were associated with the power of Anubis. 
The hyena in particular struck a chord with the Egyptians, and still does. This woman describes a recent ordeal just outside Cairo. She reports a dark hyena-like creature known locally as Sawala that attempted to abduct her four-year-old son. Lucky she was able to keep it at bay before it vanished. So far it's not clear what she actually saw, but what's certain is that the power of Anubis still lives on in the hearts and minds of some modern Egyptians. It is quite possible that this is a residue of the ancient cult to Anubis and Weprawit, which is based in Middle Egypt. And over there, there was a super canid, a super dog that was a mixture of a dog, a wolf, jackals, hyenas, and foxes. And that Anubis is sometimes a terrifying as well as a very caring kind of divinity. Perhaps the ancient cult of Anubis has sort of carried on in this way, which is why the reports of the mythological almost Salawa continue into Egypt today. So it seems that animals the Egyptians admired were worshipped. Animals the Egyptians feared were worshipped. But that's not the whole story. The same people that held animals in the highest religious esteem also loved to hunt. The pharaohs had favourite prey, and some created special hunting parks for aristocratic days off. To understand the apparent contradictions in how Egyptians related to animals, we need to look past royal or religious decadence and dig our way into everyday life. One crucial question remains unanswered. How are species selected? Why were only some chosen as sacred animals? Here, in the ruins of what was once the major city of Elephantine, the golden statues are long since plundered this other treasure here. It's a great site for a zoologist like Yoris to help archaeology teams work out how ancient people and animals live together. They're unearthing thousands of years of trash. What we're doing is looking at the formal remains uh, that are excavated at the site and in, in most of the cases we are dealing with uh, kitchen refuse and we are trying to analyze uh, this component of uh, everyday life. It's only recently that Egyptology has made headway in unraveling details of ordinary Egyptian life. Kitchen waste reveals that everything from fish to huge game animals were part of the diet. No surprise there for farmers and hunters. Huge Nile perch were mummified as offerings to the gods, or as supplies to take into the next life. And sex also played a part in determining whether or not you were sacred. We know that female hippos were revered for their devoted mothering skills. But the larger, more aggressive males were hunted and killed. The massive two-ton animals were stabbed with tiny handheld spears. A popular sport that's frequently depicted in carvings. Taking on a hippo from a canoe is only for the bravest of men. Hippos are often shown attacking crocodiles. Is that why male hippos were hunted? because they could kill the beloved god Sobek. The rules about how you've got to be a sacred animal aren't always clear. Elephants lived here once, so they must have been admired. But as far as we know, there was no elephant-headed god. Tiny pieces of carved bone, the date from well before the first pharaoh reigned in Egypt, depict a weird and wonderful menagerie. Some native, but others less familiar. The 
the Egyptians had a great love of the exotic. But to get the spectacular animals they wanted meant marching them into the country. A carnival of animals had arrived in Egypt. Ivory was brought along with living monkeys. Giraffes. Even leopards. Creatures from the southern African continent destined for the pleasure of the rich and famous of the day. The ancient Egyptians kept some of these animals as pets. And it's, it's interesting because early on we can see them experimenting with keeping various kinds of animals as pets. Pets such as gazelles, perhaps little bears, animals that didn't quite work out. And then later on we begin to see the more traditional ones. Dogs seem to be from the very earliest time period. Uh, cats perhaps a little bit later. Um, and cats being more useful perhaps for keeping away rats from the um, food sources. Many ancient Egyptians kept cats and dogs in the household, much as we do today. Although their attachment to their pets was perhaps even stronger, not in life, but in death. Pets were often mummified and preserved for the afterlife. In the barren windswept hills of El Qasar is a tomb like no other. Thought to be a family crypt, several bodies have been carefully laid here to rest. But one of them isn't like the others. What appears to be the skeleton of a dog lies alongside the human remains. Was this a beloved pet with the right to a place at its master's side for all eternity? This picture of a close human animal bond seems to contradict the suggestion that Egyptians farmed and killed animals for the express purpose of fueling huge mummy factories. When opened, the underground tombs at Saqqara shocked the world. In deep underground tunnels lie row upon row of neatly stacked jars. Each one built to house sacred birds as offerings to the god Horus. Conservative estimates suggested half a million mummies. If each jar contained a mummified bird such as this kestrel, just where did the ancient Egyptians find half a million to kill and preserve? Priests may have bred these birds specifically for sacrifice, but even then, with falcons taking months to raise just a few chicks in their lifetime, the numbers seem impossibly high. Birds of prey were chosen to represent the eminent sun god, Horus. Their aerial displays seem to tie in with the god's command of the sun and moon. With such power, it's little wonder that the people were willing to stop at nothing to keep Horus happy. Some experts believe that if you were a member of the public, the only way you could connect with a god like Horus was to buy a sacred money from a priest, which would then be offered to the god on your behalf. This could explain why there are so many jars at Saqqara. In some cultures you may light a candle, let's say, as a sign of devotion to a deity. In Egypt at one point seemed to use animals in that respect, animals that were associated again with particular deities and these would be raised, if they could be, such as ibises, in vast numbers by the priests and then they would be killed and mummified and be given to the pilgrim to then bring to the temple, we think, um, to be used in this way and left as a devotion to the god. 
but it turns out that many of the jars at Saqqara don't actually contain whole bird mummies. So what's going on? Back to the tombs at Tuna. The jars here show the effects of time, crumbled into disarray. Are four million ibis bodies stored here in tribute to their god, Thoth? It's clear that in some areas birds were raised, but were ibis kept and bred purely to be sacrificed? Was this battery farming Egyptian style? This whole animal pickling industry, if you want to call it that, to produce these votive offerings sheds a rather less pleasant light on the Egyptians' view of animals. They must have believed it was serving a purpose and that those animals, as they were under the protection of a deity, and that what they were doing did actually enhance the relationship with the deity. So, and that, so from, from, a, from a modern point of view, perhaps you could almost liken it to battery farming. But on the other hand, also taking a modern view, battery farming does fulfil a purpose, which is to produce cheap, um, readily available eggs for consumption. So there's always two sides to these things. Two sides indeed. It seems extraordinary that a bird held in such high regard as the ibis could be slaughtered or kept in cruel conditions. Maybe yet Yoris will uncover evidence that will clear the pharaohs of possible charges of animal abuse. To avoid destroying the most intact mummies, he uses x-rays to reveal how the animals died. We know from other cemeteries that sometimes animals have been killed uh, for, for the purpose of being mummified. So the question is whether in our case we are dealing with baboons or ibises that have been killed for religious purposes. So far, none of the x-rays have shown any sign of broken bones. Back out to Tuna for more samples. One ibis is about to see the sun again after 2,000 years of darkness. Opening some of the jars is vital to the investigation. A modern tool helps to break an ancient seal. The only way to wake the dead is to read the animal's bones. But although it looked like an ibis from the outside, the inside doesn't match up. There are the remains of more than one bird inside the mummy. And yet in other jars, only fragments have been found. It's a confusing picture. When you bought your animal mummy, you'd have something which clearly looked like a cat, an ibis or, or whatever, and probably would have beautiful external wrappings. However, quite often it was the case that you weren't actually being sold what you thought you were buying. In some cases, it would be incomplete. In some cases, in fact, there perhaps only be one bone of an ibis, for example, in one of these ibis mummies, or you might have nothing at all. Whether or not that, that was a total cheat, or whether you were actually buying something a little bit cheaper because it only had a, an essence of divinity rather than a complete divinity in it, is unclear. Because it was certainly believed by the Egyptians that a single piece of something could actually stand for the whole thing. Did they really believe that just a feather or a single bone was sacred? Or was this sharp practice by entrepreneurial priests? For Yoris, despite a team of researchers poring over thousands of bones, the good news is that so far there's no signs of foul play. But he needs more. At the very back of the chamber, after clambering over smashed jars and what's left of countless mummies, the site where the little primate jaw bone was found. Monkeys are not so common in the jars. So what was their role in this temple? Like the ibis, are there signs that they too avoided injury? Then, a disturbing twist. 
Among various partial skeletons, a clue. A twisted bone. What happened to the primates of Tuna El Gabel? Just when it seemed the pharaohs could be cleared of maltreating animals, this upper arm bone of a monkey with an unnatural curve. This monkey almost certainly suffered from rickets, presumably from long periods of confinement away from the sun. Was there an inevitable unsavory side to animal worship? Yoris hopes the tombs at Tuna will hold the final answer. In the ibis bones, crucial new evidence has come to light. Yoris has found clues to shatter the ideas of animal abuse and careless slaughter. In ibises, at least. Healed fractures of long leg bones are quite common at Tuna Devil. And there are some writings uh, mentioning that people were guarding the animals and feeding them. So it looks as the incidence, this high incidence of heel fractures suggests that people have been protecting these birds and feeding them. For the first time, Yoris has actual proof that Egyptians were taking care of sacred animals. What of the little primate and his cousins? Was the monkey a less worthy representative of Thoth, or have we underestimated the Egyptians here too? Yoris has a final stop on his tour. His colleague, Egyptologist Professor Dr. Dieter Kessler, shows him a site in Tuna, which houses remains of sacred baboons. The baboons of Thoth were considered among the wisest of beings, almost like a hotline to the gods. Seeing these remains, it seems unlikely the sacred monkeys like baboons would have been treated with anything other than respect. And despite finding the animal with wickets, so far Yoris can't find any hard proof that monkeys were part of mummy factories. There is no evidence that people deliberately killed either baboons or sacred ibises for ritual purposes. But the ibis and the baboon weren't the only animals used in worship. What about the mummies and remains of the other creatures, like cats, that have been found? There does seem to have been vast amounts of these animals killed, and it does um, uh, sometimes seem rather horrific. And yet, on the other hand, if we look at what we do today, we also raise hundreds, if not millions, of certain animals in very tight quarters in captivity um, for sacrifice, whether that be for dinner or for items of clothing. I don't think we should look too harshly <laughs> on the ancient Egyptians for doing that as well. In central Cairo, people still flock to see embodiments of ancient gods, perhaps hoping even today for good fortune to smile on them. Thoth's two animal representatives still draw in the crowds. And in Thebes, tourists believe that walking around the scarab anti-clockwise will bring them good luck. For some, the Egyptian dung beetle is still as potent as it was 5,000 years ago. When you look at ancient Egypt through the eyes of its sacred animals, you see a people who took a deep respect for the natural world to the ultimate mystical level. Just like us, the ancient Egyptians had a rich and complex relationship with animals. But unlike us, they gave animals the power to incite murder, to heal, even to judge men's hearts. They made animals sacred. Maybe these people had something that we've lost.
a willingness to bring animals to the very center of the human world on their own terms. Is this the ultimate lesson we could learn from the sacred animals of the pharaohs? Animals and people flourished, but the Egyptians did something unique for a mighty civilization. They set out to live in harmony with nature. This was part of their world. This was a part of their day-to-day -day life. And they integrated this and brought it into their religion, so they worked with it, not excluding it, not making it outside of their life. Their life, the religion, the animals, the people were all part of a whole. They must have had a big reason to try and maintain a balance with the natural world. Nothing is bigger than creation itself. And according to Egyptian beliefs, animals reigned from the very dawn of time. To them, the world began when a sacred cow, Emet Waret, rose from the waters of creation. She gave birth to the sun. And where she rested her feet on the water's surface, earth was formed. It's not surprising that domestic animals found their way into myth and religion. They were a source of food, companionship, and labor. But for some reason, certain creatures were singled out for special treatment. Upper class animals. This colossal 70-ton tomb in Memphis is proof that certain animals were given incredible positions of power. As extravagant as the sarcophagus of any king, this was the final resting place of a bull, attributed to Apis. Apis was the god of virility, with a cult-like following. A single animal was chosen from bulls across the land as his representative. It's important to recognize that the Egyptians, contrary to wise popular belief, didn't believe that all representatives of a specific species were divine. So that it was quite true that you had a bull sitting in a temple, but the bull just over there was not a god. He was simply a potential dinner. Only one bull at a time could be crowned the Apis bull. It lived a pampered life in a temple, and upon death was mourned by the nation, but not until after an unusual ceremony. The king may have eaten the bull when it died, therefore to take on to his own person some of the divine power. And given this was probably a 20-odd-year-old bull, you can imagine that the... Mighty pyramids in the desert. The Nile. It could only be Egypt. The pharaohs and their legacy live on in our imaginations. But behind the popular image, there's a new story to tell. One of the most celebrated eras of human achievement was a world built on animals. The Egyptians really, I think, could be viewed upon as a nation of animal lovers. It was a love that went far beyond merely keeping pets. They thought animals could be used to channel the powers of the gods for good and evil. You take an animal that is potentially very dangerous and you use its power to protect you. Feared and revered. You might think that animals never had it so good. But it's such high status come at too high a price. It's time to take a look at ancient Egypt again, through the eyes of the sacred animals of the pharaohs. This is the story of a mission to dig deep. Two hundred meters below the blistering desert, the race is on to reveal a new side of the ancient Egyptians. These passages were built 3,000 years ago as underground stores for mummies. 
With thousands of tons of sand above, there's a sense that the tunnels could collapse at any minute, but they press on. For them, it's worth the risk. Professor Joris Peters from the University of Munich has a rare skill. He's a paleozoologist, working to find evidence of how the ancient Egyptians treated animals. And that's the reason why we have to travel to Egypt and try to find more bones, more material, especially, if possible, complete individuals. And this is a major task. At Tuna El Gabel, 300 kilometers from Cairo, Yoris will join a front line in research into what is meant to be a sacred animal. The hope is that the unusually well-preserved remains at this site could change the way we think about Egyptian beliefs. In these deep underground chambers lie the remains of four million mummies. Each was perhaps not of its tenderest, so I suspect the king might have viewed having to eat this thing as a religious trial. Particularly as the earliest one we have an example of for this, the contemporary king had extremely bad teeth, including major abscesses. So trying to, trying to munch his way through um, some rather aged beef must have been a, a truly um, divine experience. It seems that in religion, the Egyptians chose influences from what they saw around them. During pharaonic times, human settlers flocked to the rich floodplain of the Nile. Wild animals also loomed large in the ancient Egyptian mindset. Living close enough to enjoy the river's wealth meant having some pretty lethal neighbors. Nile crocodiles no doubt killed people. But how did the Egyptians rationalize such a dangerous animal that was beyond their control? At the American University in Cairo, Dr. Salima Ikram has a compelling theory. They believed to some extent that certain animals were representative of certain gods. So a crocodile would be representative for the god Sobek. And the Egyptians believed that the spirit of the god would enter into one particular crocodile. They would pray to it, they would care for it, and it would be a god. By channeling the terrifying killing power of crocodiles into the god Sobek, the people perhaps convinced themselves that they could convert their fear to something more useful. No expense was spared when it came to worshipping their crocodile god. When it died, they would bury that god after mummifying it in a very elaborate way, the same way that you would do for kings or indeed any other divinity. The crocodile's body was dried and embalmed with salts before being carefully wrapped and decorated. But why take dangerous animals with you into the afterlife? An interesting point about Sobek and other gods who were represented by dangerous animals is that there was two sides to them and through the cult it was hoped that the god would tame, if you like, the dangerous side but also channel the power inherent in that dangerous side towards good, towards the king and towards the good of Egypt. And the crocodile isn't the only potential man-killer that these ancient religious cults set out to tame in their... At the University of Wales, Kasha believes that many answers to why animals were sacred don't rest with the gods or the pharaohs. What I'm interested in is finding out what the common people, people like you and I, what they did, how they prayed, who they prayed to when they were scared, what did they do to protect themselves. If we can understand what people were scared of, maybe we will understand the role of sacred animals. For Dr. Aidan Dodson from the Bristol University in the UK, looking at major gods like Thoth can help. Thoth was the clever god. He was the scribe of the gods. He was regarded as having invented writing, for example. And he had two sacred animals. One was the ibis, 
probably because the ibis looks clever. It's sort of, you know, that, with its long beak, it gives an idea of perhaps a scholarly kind of individual. The other um, aspect of him was the baboon, almost the complete opposite, it's very much a, a different kind of behaving animal. Baboons, one of the things they do in the morning is they get very excited when the sun rises and almost act as the herald of the rising sun. So Thoth is an interesting um, god in having two d distinct um, sacred animals. Can understanding the role of the gods like Thoth help explain the primate bones found in Tuna el Gabel? If animals like the baboon and ibis were so revered, how could they have been killed in their millions? Have we misread the signs? Or did being a sacred animal mean paying the ultimate price? Were the ancient Egyptians nature worshippers or animal killers? As archaeologists dig to unlock the secrets of the ancients, they reveal a very different picture of Egypt. Just by looking at hieroglyphs, it's clear that the ancient Egyptians brought animals to the heart of their religion and day-to-day -day life. But unravelling why they did this is another matter. Piece by piece, a body of evidence is emerging from the dust and it's turning up a few surprises. This was once the realm of giants. 7,000 years ago, these lands were very different. Reverse massive climate change, and you're back in a landscape not unlike the plains of East Africa today, with the life-giving Nile at its heart, animal mummies. In recent years, a number of parent mummy factories have been opened, and stories have spewed out of Egypt of terrible animal abuse and mass killing. But can new evidence shed light on the mindset of these people? Were the pharaohs really cruel when they used animals in worship? Just as claustrophobia begins to set in, the jawbone of a young monkey. Piecing together the story of this little primate might help Yoris to understand what was really going on back then. As Egyptologist Kasia Sherpakovska knows. It was a very complex relationship between people and animals and their role in religion, and that's why it seems complicated to us today. Yoris's approach is to find evidence of how certain sacred animals lived and died. In ancient Egypt, uh, people have produced a lot of depictions of animals on the walls of the tombs. And what we see actually is that these animals are all healthy and it's a huge variety of species. It is of interest to know whether these animals are really healthy. And that's the reason why we try to look at animal remains from archaeological sites. And I'm particularly interested in uh, baboons and sacred ibises. It is of interest to know whether these animals were kept and bred at these places and whether they were really healthy. But to do that will involve waking the dead. The 5,000-year-old Djoser Pyramid, oldest of all, and countless other temples sparked an interest in unraveling the secrets of the sacred animals of ancient Egypt. Sculptures, paintings and texts, richly inspired by nature, captured the world's imagination. Some animals represented a living connection to the gods. Others were even allowed to make the final judgments on a human soul at the gateway to the afterlife. Animals influenced a rich array of gods controlling life and death. Horus, the falcon god of the sun. Apis, the bull with the power of the creator. Anubis, the jackal-headed god from the underworld. <laughs> 